sun. This piece of California desert is hallowed ground. A land of firsts. America's first jet plane, first rocket plane, first flying wing, and first space shuttle landing. It's where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier and where the X-43 scramjet took jet power to nearly 10 times the speed of sound. Now, Edwards Air Force Base on Modern Marvels. Even from space, the huge dry lake at Edwards Air Force Base can be a comforting sight. Located in California's Antelope Valley, the 44 square mile dry lake bed is a huge natural landing field. It's obvious uh, when you're over this area, the, uh, the lake bed's uh, seven miles wide and 15 miles long, and it's a uh, bright, light tan that stands out, uh, so there's no missing it from orbit. Test pilot and former astronaut Gordon Fullerton piloted the space shuttle out of its orbit around the Earth to a safe landing in Edwards. Our uh, reentry started uh, over the Indian Ocean in the dark, and so uh, we were down much lower altitude when the sun came up as we were crossing the South Pacific. So the entry was mostly in daylight. Columbia, you got perfect energy, perfect ground track. What a way to come to California. And then that the dry lake bed here at Edwards stood out. It's a terrific landmark for any aviator, and uh, we're right on course. Over the past six decades, more major milestones in flight have occurred at this base than anywhere else on Earth. More than 150 airplanes have made their first flights here. Mach 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 were all exceeded here for the first time. From here, men first climbed in airplanes above 100,000 feet, 200,000 feet, 300,000 feet. It was here the space shuttle landed after its first orbital flight in April of 1981. One of the biggest new projects at Edwards is the futuristic airborne laser weapon, which will be carried aboard a Boeing 747. These airborne laser aircraft will patrol in pairs, scanning the horizon for missiles. If they detect one, a high-energy laser will be fired at the missile in a three to five second burst. This building houses the test program, which is scheduled to continue until 2013. It's at the south end of Rogers Dry Lake. The airplane nose protruding from the building is not just for decoration. On the other side of the wall is a 747 fuselage used for ground testing the weapon. In front of the airborne laser building, in the parking lot, is a seldom noticed concrete pit that played a crucial role in breaking the sound barrier. Chuck Yeager's X-1 rocket plane was lowered into this pit to allow connection to the B-29 bomber that carried it aloft to break the sound barrier. The problem with the X-1 was that it was taller than the ground clearance of a B-29. So the simplest way was to erect a pit, back it down in there, taxi the mother plane over on top of it, and then just jack it up. And having served its purpose, it's still here today. It fills with water every winter, just about. It's a playground for frogs but it's still historic. It's hard to avoid bumping into history all over the 300,000 acres that make up Edwards Air Force Base. The Air Force Flight Test Center, or AFFTC, has been the aeronautical equivalent of Mecca for more than 60 years. Nearly every aircraft to enter the Air Force inventory has been tested here. How and why did Edwards become the premier flight test center in America? The simple answer is a real estate cliche. Location, location, location. Edwards wouldn't be Edwards without Rogers Dry Lake, which the base encompasses. The largest lake bed of its kind in the world, it's smoothed perfectly flat by the winds that blow across it during the annual winter rains. This lake bed, when it's dry, can support a weight of 20,000 pounds to the square foot. What this means is that any aircraft or spacecraft now or visualized in the future can land here perfectly safely. Various runways are marked on the lake bed, one of them more than seven miles long. A 15,000 foot concrete runway is located next to Rogers Dry Lake. Edwards today includes nearly 5,000 active duty personnel, 8,000 family members, and 3,400 civilians. 
The base has three elementary schools and a secondary school, as well as a golf course, riding stables, a bowling alley, and a movie theater. Edwards has come a long way from its early days as a remote desert outpost known as Muroc. It got its name from a couple who settled in the area in 1910. But their name wasn't Muroc, it was Corum. Clifford and Effie Corum reversed the letters in their last name and called their new community Muroc, after discovering California already had a town called Corum. In 1933, the military arrived at Muroc and changed it forever. Lieutenant Colonel Hap Arnold of the U.S. Army Air Corps, commander of nearby March Field, was looking for a place to train bomber and fighter crews. He saw this enormous flat expanse of dry lake bed. In his eyes, it was a natural aerodrome. So he uh, sent up a crew here, September 1933, and they laid out a bombing and gunnery range along the east shore of the lake bed, right, right along that ridge up there. Uh, these guys, local settlers, felt sorry for them because they were stuck literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the locals called them the Foreign Legion of the Army Air Corps. They often thought of this place as the hot Siberia of the Army Air Corps. Someone else arrived at Muroc in the 1930s, perhaps not so important as the Air Corps, but a force to be reckoned with nonetheless. Her name was Florence Poncho Barnes, a wealthy socialite and pilot. She set speed records for women aviators that rivaled those of Amelia Earhart. She also became Hollywood's first female stunt pilot. She flew a stunt plane in Hell's Angels. She knew Howard Hughes. She went out with Raymond Navarro. She was well connected and had an awfully good time. Poncho was born in a fantastic mansion, had all kinds of money, had all kinds of social position, all of which she lost during the Depression. So she had married a pastor in Pasadena, a pastor of a very uh, upscale Episcopal church, and no sooner had she become the wife of the Reverend Mr. Barnes then she began uh, running weapons for the Mexican revolutionaries. In 1935, Barnes traded some property for an alfalfa farm. She soon began supplying the base with fresh milk and pork from her farm east of Muroc. Later, Barnes would build a restaurant and bar on her property, which would become a legendary hangout for test pilots. In 1941, after the U.S. entered World War II, Muroc Bombing and Gunnery Range was renamed Muroc Army Air Base, and many pilots destined for combat were trained there. The base also took on a new role, flight testing. It would turn out to be Muroc's true calling. General Albert Boyd, who many consider the father of modern flight testing, called this place God's gift to the U.S. Air Force, and meaning specifically that lake bed. Previously, most military planes have been flight tested at Wright Field in Ohio. But Wright was overloaded because of the war effort. A crucial new top secret project was going to need a more remote location and better weather to ensure rapid development. At a remote spot on the north shore of Rogers Dry Lake, the Army Air Corps built a new test site for America's first jet plane, the Bell XP 59A Era Comet. It first flew in 1942, but it was kept secret even from the rest of the base. These were airplane people. They'd see an airplane sitting out here every day on the ramp, perhaps, with no prop, and they'd begin to ask questions. For that reason, they actually just built a small dummy prop that they affixed to the nose of the P-59 whenever it was out here on the ramp. Now called North Base, the area is abandoned, surrounded by tumbleweed and visited by the occasional coyote. The hangar, as you can see, right on the edge of the lake bed so that they could taxi the airplane right out and take off any time they needed to, going almost any direction. The Bell Era Comet was soon followed by a second jet, the Lockheed XP-80 Shooting Star, which turned out to be a much more successful aircraft. In the words of Larry Bell of Bell Aircraft, it's nice to be first, but the money is in being second. A little-known maintenance officer from Wright Field uh, came out here for the first time, 19, September 1945, and he came out to uh, be part of the team that conducted the accelerated service tests on the new P-80 shooting star. His name was Captain Chuck Yeager. When Chuck Yeager first got here, he said the place looked like the ass end of the moon to him. 
Bob Hoover arrived at Muroc at around the same time, and he and Jaeger soon began testing new Air Force planes at the base. You had the, the opportunity of safety up there because of that dry lake bed. And it saved my neck two or three times. Uh, on one occasion, I touched down at 240 knots. And the landing gear and wheels had never been up to that kind of speed before. And it was one of the smoothest landings I've ever ridden through. But I rolled 11 miles across that lake bed. One of the most exciting eras in aviation history, the turbojet revolution, ushered in the golden age of flight testing and gave birth to an archetypal image, that of the dashing and daring test pilot. One of them, Chuck Yeager, was about to do what some considered impossible. Approximately 10,000 years ago, Lake Thompson, an Ice Age remnant, dried up. Rogers Dry Lake is part of its ancient lake bed. Edwards Air Force Base will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Edwards Air Force Base on Modern Marvels. The turbojet revolution was the first of many revolutions at Muroc, each made possible or made necessary by its predecessor. After the turbojet revolution came the supersonic revolution. The rocket-powered Bell X-1 was the first in a long series of research airplanes designed to explore the unknown frontier beyond the speed of sound. There had been speculation about whether it was even possible for an airplane to break the so-called sound barrier. Some scientists warned that G-forces might become infinite at the speed of sound and destroy the aircraft. The rocket engine that would propel the X-1 was also full of unknowns. When the X-1 program came along, rocket motors were, of course, a very new idea. A lot of unknown quantities, and they tended to blow up occasionally. So what was needed was a secluded area where you could test the engines and monitor them. What could be better than one of the revetments? Adobe structures called revetments were built in the mid-40s at the airbase as experimental field shelters for aircraft. The X-1 rocket engine was tested at this one, on the south side of Rogers Dry Lake. We're standing right now in the middle of the rocket engine test stand, which was built in the middle of this B-29 revetment. Over here, you can see the blockhouse. It's a very simple affair with a thick armored glass window. In here, the project engineers, a couple of scientists, the managers would be standing protected, watching the rocket motor run. The rocket engine would have been suspended about where I'm standing, with the head end of the rocket pointed toward the adobe wall, and the nozzle end pointed out this way, so that the rocket blast would roll harmlessly out across the desert and into the lake bed. Beginning with the X-1 project, most purely experimental research at the base would be conducted jointly by two government agencies, one military and the other civilian. It's always thought of as an Air Force base, and indeed it is, but it also has had a, another component. Uh, it had a group from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or the NACA. The uh, small group of six arrived here in September 1946. And they came out because uh, of the famous X-1 program. Decades later, the NACA changed its name. We know it today as NASA. But whatever the project that the airplane was designed for, it would be first flown by the Air Force, who would test it, make sure it was safe, and they would fly the airplane out to the limits of its performance. And then it would be turned over to NACA, which was located right here at Edwards Air Force Base. In the 1950s, most record-breaking flights were celebrated at the bar and restaurant built by Poncho Barnes on her farm near the base. Barnes also had a fly-in motel with its own airstrip. Poncho Barnes Flying In, that was the official name of it. Um, this was a bar out in the desert, so weather-beaten so run down, uh, such a mess that no one making a movie about it would have dared make anything as dilapidated. Where we're standing was the heart of the motel area. Pancha had built two rows of cabins right here on the concrete, and a number of the young pilots volunteered their time and effort and built a famous three-tiered fountain in the center of the courtyard of the motel. And you'll notice that the pool there, which they also built, 
outlines the U.S. Air Force insignia. Beyond there where the chimney is was the restaurant, the bar, the dance floor, and Poncho's house was just beyond. Over beers at Poncho's, civilian test pilots and Air Force test pilots frequently disagreed. Civilian test pilots didn't have much to do with the, the military test pilots. And I remember one fellow by the name of Gene Mays, who was with Douglas, and he asked me about how much flying time I had, and I said, 1,500 hours in fighters. And he said, well, I've got 10,000. I think I'm more qualified than you Air Force youngsters. And I said, well, Mr. May, I said, 10,000 hours of cub time doesn't mean very much when you're flying a rocket ship or a jet. <laughs> Poncho got a big kick out of that. So she said, whoever goes faster than sound first will get a free steak dinner on the house. On October 14th, 1947, Chuck Yeager and the X-1 with Bob Hoover flying behind in a chase plane first proved that the mysterious and feared sound barrier wasn't really a barrier at all. I got a picture of him at, as he went by. It was the first time we had a photograph of the diamond shock waves coming out the, from the exhaust of the rocket motors. I knew he had accomplished his mission. So on the way down, I said, uh, Part, I think you're going to get that free steak dinner tonight. Yeager got his free steak at Poncho's, but the celebration was cut short when an officer arrived from headquarters. We hadn't any more than been there maybe 30 or 40 minutes and somebody came in and, and said uh, it's classified as top secret we're not to talk about it the details of that day remained largely unknown to the public until a few decades later when author Tom Wolfe wrote a book called The Right Stuff published in 1979 it was turned into a movie that won four Academy Awards in 1983 Jaeger was well known within the flying fraternity as a combat hero, as a man who broke the sand barrier, but outside of it, he was not known at all. Uh, I had never heard of Chuck Jaeger when I went to Edwards. <laughs> uh, uh, I was just there to see how the astronauts had trained. And in a way, Jaeger took over my book because his exploits were more in a kind of primitive way, much more daring than anything that the uh, astronauts did, or more colorful. In November of 1953, the good times at Poncho's came to an end when a restaurant and motel mysteriously burned to the ground. Today, as planes like the Airborne Laser are flight tested overhead. That's it, all right, with this chase plane. The burned out ruins of Poncho Barnes Place remain below. Here we are in the remains of the past, and the future is taking off right over our heads with the airborne laser. Good times and bad times populate the past at Edwards, and some of its memories are buried in its soil. Peter Merlin is hunting for history. This is a crash site of the YV-49 flying wing. They were testing control forces and apparently overstressed the airframe. Broke off the outer wing panels and the plane crashed right behind us. An aviation researcher who does historical archiving at Edwards, Merlin calls his hobby aviation archaeology. Some say the revolutionary YB-49 flying wing bomber that crashed here was too far ahead of its time. This piece here uh, is part of a hinge line with some structure and skin of the aircraft. It's a good sized piece. Here's part of the plexiglass from the windows. It was an eight engine jet bomber. There was a lot of fuel on board, so there was quite a fire. Without the computer controlled flight systems of today's modern fighters and bombers, the flying wing had limited stability and was difficult to control. See, this is quite a screen this is making. I'm, I think I may do a little digging here. I got a piece of rusty steel. There's a bolt through it and a nut. 
it's very corroded, but heavy. Hard to say what it was. This crash gave Edwards Air Force Base its name. Captain Glenn Edwards and four other men were killed in the mishap, and a year later, in December 1949, Muroc Air Force Base was renamed Edwards Air Force Base in honor of Captain Edwards. It wasn't the first tragedy at the base, and it wouldn't be the last. No one knew better than the test pilots that the job had its risks. But in spite of the dangers and setbacks, a golden age of aeronautical research would come to Edwards Air Force Base in the 1950s. Experimental rocket planes continued to raise the bar for speed and altitude. Chuck Yeager set a new record in 1953 as he piloted the second generation Bell X-1A to a speed of Mach 2.44, or 1,650 miles per hour. Yeager's record was broken less than three years later when Captain Mel Apt in the Bell X-2 became the first man to fly faster than Mach 3. For about a minute and a half, he was the fastest man in the world. At that point, he tried to slow down and turn back toward the lake bed to glide in and make his landing there, just like the X-1. Seconds after hitting Mach 3.2, the X-2 rocket plane tumbled violently out of control and crashed in the desert near the base. It crashed over here at the lip of the sandy wash and broke into several pieces. The engine section was right over here, the mid-fuselage assembly and wings, and the forward fuselage lay over there. We got a piece of the skin of the airplane. You can see it's still got the white paint on it. To continue developing faster and safer military aircraft, Edwards flight researchers would need to process reams of complex data from test flights. Without computers, Edwards would have to find a unique solution. In May of 1953, in a flight that began at Edwards, civilian pilot Jacqueline Cochran became the first woman to exceed the speed of sound. Her chase pilot was Chuck Yeager. Edwards Air Force Base will... Re we now return to Edwards Air Force Base on Modern Marvels. In the early days of flight testing at Edwards, some of the most difficult work involved the detailed analysis of complex flight data. In 1952, Betty Love joined a team of women called computers who booted up and crunched the numbers every day. When I went to work, we were issued a six inch film scale, a light box. We were given a triangle, a pointer to be used to read the calibration, and we were given certain pencils, 2H pencils to use. The women who came here were known as computers because very simply they computed. They computed data from, from these film strips. And it was quite an art. It was done uh, in an office here in, uh, in which uh, silence was golden, uh, noise wasn't, conversation was not tolerated. Flight information was recorded aboard test planes on rolls of film. The women known as computers turned the film into tables and graphs for the engineers. I have a VGH recorder here that recorded airspeed, altitude, and lateral and vertical acceleration. And on this particular flight, we were looking for turbulence. This is vertical acceleration. We were more interested in the frequency that it happened, so we would count 10 seconds worth of this data. This is a chart that I did for one of the engineers. This is a chart of velocity versus altitude, and it shows the curve lines for dynamic pressure. Most of the women were transferred to Edwards from the NACA Research Center in Langley, Virginia. Coming to their new home in the desert was a rude awakening. It wasn't green, the wind blew, it was cold, and when the wind blew, the sand blew, and the dorms weren't built that tight and consequently the sand went through you could have a hangar closed up and it would be a, enough sand that would seep in through the crevices whereby they could take a truckload of sand out of that hangar after about three days of high winds the sand and wind were a constant problem but as progress continued at edwards both the accommodations and the aircraft got better 
In the late 50s, the Air Force flight testers and their civilian counterparts at the NACA and later NASA began testing what many regard as the most important series of research aircraft ever flown, the North American X-15 rocket planes. The space age was bringing new priorities to Edwards. The base now had to develop aircraft that could explore the unknown frontier beyond the Earth's atmosphere. The budget of NASA, obviously before 1958, it was principally an aeronautics budget. After 1958, aeronautics became only the first A in NASA, and its budget, as you would expect, became more slender. The rocket-powered X-15 was the first aircraft to explore exo-atmospheric flight. That is, outside the Earth's atmosphere. Roger, you got the full throttle? It was also the first aircraft to achieve hypersonic flight, more than five times the speed of sound. A typical flight, of course, starts under the wing of the B-52 mothership. Bill Dana started work at Edwards on the X-15 program on the very day in 1958 that the NACA became NASA. It was a muscle airplane. When the engine lit, you knew it. It pinned you back in the, in the seat, and you were kind of along for the ride. And acceleration due to the rocket burning got to be about 4 Gs at burnout, and it was starting to get painful. After 199 flights over nearly a decade, the X-15 program finally came to an end in 1968. The last man to fly the X-15 was Bill Dana. We didn't go to orbit, but we went to Mach 6, which gave us heating and stability information that allowed us to build the space shuttle. Atmospheric flight continued to be explored at Edwards with air-breathing jet-powered aircraft, such as the giant XB-70 Valkyrie supersonic bomber. The 500,000-pound Valkyrie could fly at three times the speed of sound. Well, it was a good flying airplane. It was an airplane that uh, you certainly wanted to be well prepared for any emergency. You only had two crew members in the B-70, and so uh, you had to, you were your own flight engineer, you might say, so you had to run all the systems. The huge and exotic Valkyrie could droop its wingtips as much as 65 degrees during flight, which provided improved stability at supersonic speeds. You don't have any great realization of speed, except that you know that if you, if you turn over the Canadian border and you'll be back to Edwards in 30 minutes, you, you know that's fast. It was conceived as a high-altitude bomber, but only two Valkyries were built because of budget limitations. One of the XB-70s was lost in a fatal mid-air collision in 1966 during a promotional photo shoot. The pilot managed to eject and land safely, but the co-pilot was killed, along with a pilot of the F-104 chase plane that collided with the Valkyrie. The cause of them running together may not ever be really known. Either Carl Cross, who did not get out of the airplane, was unable to pull the handle to eject himself or else he was incapacitated due to the G-forces the airplane spinning. Even faster than the Valkyrie, the mysterious SR-71 Blackbird, a spy plane with first-generation stealth technology, routinely cruised at speeds in excess of Mach 3 and at altitudes well above 80,000 feet. The legendary Blackbirds were used for high-altitude reconnaissance by the Air Force until their role was taken over by satellites in the 1990s. But their speed record still stands. The Blackbirds are faster than any known manned jet aircraft. But even a Blackbird would look slow compared to the space shuttle, which would evolve from an unusual series of wingless aircraft soon to be tested at Edwards. One of these ungainly airplanes would be dubbed the Flying Bathtub. In a single stop, the brakes of the XB-70 Valkyrie absorbed the kinetic energy it takes to stop 800 automobiles from a speed of 100 miles per hour. Edwards Air Force Base will return on Modern We now return to Edwards Air Force Base on Modern Marvels. A group of strange-looking aircraft began to streak through the skies above Edwards in the mid-60s. They were called heavyweight lifting bodies and helped pave the way for the space shuttle. These wingless aircraft relied on the fuselage alone to create lift. I went straight from the cockpit of the F X-15 to the 
to the HL-10, which was one of four heavy weightlifting bodies that NASA and the Air Force tested. They flew a lot better than they looked like they should. The lifting bodies proved that the shuttle would not need onboard jet engines to land, and in fact could land dead stick, that is, without power. NASA had originally planned to have as many as four jet engines on board the shuttle. Ten, two, one, touchdown. They took the jet engines out of the uh, space shuttle, and that resulted in a, uh, a savings of a million pounds of launch takeoff weight. In the early 70s, a new technological revolution would transform flight testing at Edwards. It was the systems revolution, and it was brought on by advancements in avionics. The word avionics, a contraction of aviation and electronics, was coined to describe electronic systems used in aircraft. Progress in avionics would allow the development of so-called fly-by-wire flight control systems at Edwards, which used computers to replace conventional mechanical controls. In the late 1970s, at a secret location, the Edwards Flight Test Center was leading the way in yet another revolution. It was the Stealth Revolution. An Edwards test pilot and a pair of flight test engineers were testing Lockheed's low observable technology demonstrator, codenamed Have Blue. The test program, conducted jointly by the Edwards Flight Test Center and Lockheed, soon led to a new attack aircraft, the F 117A Nighthawk also known as the Stealth Fighter. Edwards Air Force Base also played a crucial role in flight testing the first space shuttle, which first took to the skies on top of a modified 747 called the Shuttle Carrier. Fitz Fulton flew the shuttle carrier on a number of missions. It handles much better without the shuttle, but with the shuttle, it still flies pretty good. The speed of that airplane with the shuttle on top is about two-thirds of the speed of a standard airplane, and it uses twice the amount of fuel per hour. The shuttle first separated from the 747 and glided to a test landing at Edwards in August of 1977. Then, after more than a decade of research and testing, on April 14, 1981, the wheels of the space shuttle Columbia touched down on Rogers Dry Lake Bay after its first space mission. It was the first orbiting space vehicle ever to leave the Earth on rocket power and fly back to Earth on wings like an airplane. In the 1980s, as the complexity of avionics increased rapidly, new systems were needed to handle huge amounts of experimental flight data. New facilities were created at Edwards to allow more testing of software-intensive aircraft systems on the ground. One of them was the Modeling and Simulation Facility, located on the west side of Rogers Dry Lake. What we do here in the Modeling and Simulation Facility is we want to um, basically test the scenario before we actually go fly. So early in the development program, we'll get our engineers involved with the development of a system. They'll learn as much as they can about it, and they'll bring that information to the a facility like this to actually uh, fly an airplane in a realistic environment, but a model and simulation environment, but as realistic as we can nevertheless. The system can be configured to emulate any aircraft, including planes that haven't even been built yet. The next level of ground testing at Edwards is called hardware in the loop testing. Where we'll take actual hardware from our system. Uh, for example, we have an F-16 airplane duplicated on a bench upstairs. We'll take the actual hardware, the radar, the avionics, and put them on a bench with the actual cables, because cable length quite often is very important. And we will replicate flying that airplane on the ground uh, using the actual hardware. And over here we have some of the avionics computers uh, that go on board the F-16. We've got the general avionics computer that is uh, one of the main computers for the actual avionics on board the aircraft. It's also connected to the fire control radar uh, that is one of the main computers for the actual fire control radar, the F-16 radar. We have more of the F-16 radar here, uh, the boxes for the transmitter. So these are all parts of the radar that go inside the F-16. They all couple with the actual antenna, which is behind that bulkhead right here. So behind that bulkhead is an F-16 antenna that'll sweep when we're doing a test, going back and forth sweeping. And it's looking out over the dry lake bed, the Edwards Dry Lake Bed. A lot of our tests are really about integration of old weapons into the airplane with new software loads. This particular one right here is a Maverick. It's an infrared version of a Maverick missile. So we're, when we do tests with this, we're just making sure that the Maverick missile integrates 
correctly with the new software loads from the F-16. Right next door is the Benefield Anechoic facility, the largest of its kind in the world. It's used to test electronic systems, including communications and radar, in an environment free of radio interference or reflections that is similar to the environment found in flight. The dictionary says anechoic is free from echo or free from reflection. So once we're inside that chamber, uh, all the electromagnetic signals, the radar signals, the radio signals don't bounce off the walls. It's because we have the walls completely aligned with what we call RAM or radar absorbent material. And there's over 51,000 pieces of this RAM, which is a carbon impregnated fiber foam that uh, absorbs the radar and radio uh, waves as they are in the chamber. It's about 260 feet by 250 feet by 70 feet high on the inside of the chamber. We can hang uh, any fighter-sized aircraft from a ho any one of two hoists in the chamber. We have a 80-foot uh, diameter turntable in the middle of the chamber we can rotate aircraft on. As high-tech developments in avionics continued in the 1980s, they helped bring a familiar sight back to Edwards Air Force Base. Large flying wings would be in the skies above Rogers Dry Lake for the first time in nearly 40 years. But this time, they would have computerized flight controls to keep them in the air. The door of the Benefield Anechoic Chamber is the largest single-piece door in the world and takes 45 minutes to open or close. Edwards Air Force Base will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Edwards Air Force Base on Modern Marvels. Although the original Northrop Flying Wing was a failure at Edwards in the 1940s, new developments in avionics have made the flying wing design more viable. And Northrop tried again, this time successfully. The new flying wing bomber, first flight tested at Edwards in the late 80s, has exactly the same wingspan as the first flying wing, 172 feet. The highly advanced B-2 bomber was designed almost entirely by computer. It has low observable characteristics that represent a third generation of stealth technology after the first generation SR-71 and second generation F-117 Nighthawk. After the B-2 stealth bomber, the next state-of-the-art combat aircraft to be tested at Edwards was the F-A-22 Raptor, a new air dominance fighter, which combines stealth with supersonic cruise ability. Its testing continues at Edwards. It is the greatest fighter plane ever, and I didn't start to realize exactly how much capability that went into it until I started understanding some of the technical issues. Uh, there's nothing on the Raptor that's there by accident, whether it was for radar reflections or whether it was for heat signature or, you know, what it was for top speed or loads or, you know, all the different shapes serve a purpose. I, I think right now any fighter pilot that's flying any other aircraft out there would, you know, be lying if he said he didn't want to fly it at least once. And after they fly it once, they'll be hooked. It's an awesome aircraft to fly. In the northeast corner of Edwards Air Force Base is a large complex of rocket test stands, where more reliable, more economical, and more powerful rocket engines are being developed for future space missions and for military applications. Test Stand 1A was originally designed and built more than 50 years ago to develop the rocket engine for the first intercontinental ballistic missile. The 65-square-mile rocket complex is operated by the Air Force Research Laboratory. Radical new ideas in jet-powered aircraft continue to be explored at Edwards. One of them is the $41 million Active Aerolastic Wing, or AAW project, being developed at the NASA Dryden Flight Research Center on the west side of Rogers Dry Lake. The AAW is a high-tech version of something the Wright brothers pioneered using wing warping to control the flight of an aircraft. Orville Wright didn't have ailerons or flaps for control when he flew the first airplane in 1903. Lying in a saddle connected by cables to both wingtips, he steered the plane by rolling his hips from side to side and warping the wingtips up or down. With the Wright brothers' idea, which is to actually warp one, one wing up and one wing down, uh, you can have a very flexible wing. And uh, our technology is basically to apply the the idea is a wing warping at, at very high speed on a, a supersonic jet. When I make an input that says I want to roll the airplane, let's say, to the left at a certain rate, the leading edge and trailing edge surfaces will deflect not to roll the airplane, but actually to twist the wing structure, if you will, like taking a towel and twisting it, such that as the wing structure twists, the lift 
on that generated by that wing will change and the airplane will actually roll based on the twisted structure. Before flight testing at Edwards, the AAW's wings were modified by the Boeing Phantom Works, which installed thin, flexible skin panels to allow warping. There was a lot of trepidation. One of the challenges of this type of technology is that you're introducing very high loads and unknown loads into the wing structure. Also at the NASA Research Center at Edwards, in the same hangar as the AAW, is the Pathfinder, a remotely piloted flying wing designed to stay aloft for long periods. With its solar power and 120-foot wingspan, it could conceivably stay in the air for weeks or even months at a time. A true flying wing design, the Pathfinder maneuvers without rudders, ailerons, or tail surfaces. Fittingly, it's being tested at the home of the flying wing, Edwards Air Force Base. What goes around, comes around. The Pathfinder was first developed as a military plane for high-altitude, long-endurance surveillance. In the early 80s, it was originally developed under a classified program, and so nobody heard about it until about 1992, 1993. The military program was later canceled, and now the NASA Research Center at Edwards is exploring the Pathfinder's potential for non-military uses. Some of the things they could do are in the area of agriculture. You could do survey large stretches of land to search out drought situations, uh, flooding situations, disease situations. We can be used for forest fire detection, brush fire detection. You can do it for border patrol, pipeline patrol. We like the idea of calling this like a poor man's satellite. As new recruits get their wings at Edwards, old timers are retired. In 2004, one of Edwards' most distinguished veterans, this B-52 that once carried the X-15 aloft, took off on its final flight from Edwards. Test pilot and former astronaut Gordon Fullerton was at the controls as the mothership carried its latest fledgling, the X-43 scramjet, into the skies above Rogers Dry Lake. After release from the bomber known as 008, the unmanned scramjet flew faster than any air-breathing jet airplane has ever flown, nearly 10 times the speed of sound. I remember in college seeing 008 lifting the X-15 up on the news programs of the day. Uh, I came here in 1986 and uh, have flown it ever since until uh, a couple weeks ago when we did the final X-43 flight. As an Air Force test pilot, a NASA test pilot, and an astronaut, Gordon Fullerton has witnessed generations of revolutionary change at Edwards. In my 46th year of being on active flying status, so I've accumulated a lot of hours. There's been a lot of advancement in uh, uh, what airplanes can do, and certainly what spacecraft can do. The turbojet revolution, the supersonic revolution, the space revolution, the systems revolution, and the stealth revolution, all presented problems that sometimes seemed insurmountable. But Edwards Air Force Base took them on. It was so American. It was absolutely an American experience. Essentially, it was a bunch of guys who just get together and say, never mind a lot of rules and regulations all right, we want to do it. We just, we're just going to, to do it. It was really a mid-20th century version of the American West. Americans created their own law in the West, uh, and within certain restrictions, that was precisely what was being done at Edwards. Edwards has come a long way from its Wild West days. Launch, launch, launch. Although it continues to break through barriers, as always, it's done with a little help from the world's largest dry lake bed. That lake bed is the reason why this place will continue to be right at the center of American flight research. It's still God's gift to the U.S. Air Force. Edwards continues to be what it was 60 years ago, simply the best place in the world to test an airplane.